there, so I would like to be rather full. Careful here when it comes to understanding Heraclitus and as we earlier mentioned in the little article of uh, Maurizio uh, there are some likeness between the Babylonian thinking and Heraclitus of course there's a lot of differences as well so I will look into one of the recommendations from uh, Maurizio at the end of his reference uh, the structure of the universe I will look into now and it's a book from Famirop philosophy before the Greeks and it's mighty interesting this is how the Babylonians saw things and thinking and logic and remember this is before the proposition this is long before we had anything like Syntaxis. This is long before uh, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. We are now a little bit before everything. I think that's rather fitting because we mentioned many times before the pre Socratic, and now we can go to the pre pre Socratic, the Babylonians, that is. Palmyrop's book is very interesting, to say the least. Make sure the microphone is... I jump into chapter 5 of his book. This is page 171. Chapter is the structure of the knowledge of the universe. Diviners like the world famous fictional detective Sherlock Holmes. They explore small details for clues most of us would not recognize as pertinent. In order to make inferences about what has happened or is about to happen. It is not the large picture that counts, but the minute trace, the speck of the cigarette ash for Holmes, the little blemish on the liver's upper lobe for the diviner. There has to be logic in the move from the observed detail to the conclusion, however. Sherlock Holmes's alleged deductions had to confirm to contemporary rationality or his adventures would be unconvincing or lose their appeal. With diviners we may suspend belief in modern reason but we do not expect some order and regularity but we do expect some order and regularity otherwise their skill would seem pointless. Some divinatory systems had written manuals to guide interpretation. The Chinese Book of Changes, the Yi Jing or the Wu Qing, for example, but they are rare. Many systems, such as ancient Greek divination, existed in an oral setting that excluded books. They did not leave behind a description of the fundamentals of their divinatory explanation. But the tens of thousands of individual omens stating the clues observed and the interpretation drawn from them must have some coherence to them. Our challenge is to find it. We thus need a semiotic analysis of the divinatory statement. And that is what we propose to do here. Using the same methods as I did for lexical lists, it may not turn us into believers in the powers of Babylonian diviners, but it should show us some of the truth in their methods. A structural analysis. Just like the lexical entry, which we studied in part two, and the legal paragraph, which we will study in part four, the omen was always part of a list that presented a series of individual cases. 
with its interest in every aspect of the universe. Divination scope had no limits. Each ominous occurrence deserved its own entry in the texts. The parallelism with laws and lexical entries are clear. Omens read like legal clauses and the endless succession of minor variants easily reminds us of the word lists. A structural analysis is thus as applicable to the Omen series as it is to the two other genres. Paragraph The Syntagma. The individual entry in the Omen list is at, at the same time the simplest and most startling element of all the three genres studied here. The structure of the syntagma is very straightforward and is rigorous, rigorously applied over a mass of writings and an enormous time span. But the reasoning behind the individual statements mostly escapes us. Every omen has the same format. If X, then Y. We identify the two elements as in the study of Greek and Roman divinations with the terms protasis and apodosis. Question post and return. Un unlike low codes, there are no relative clauses whenever or declarative sentences in Roman series. In the protasis events are described as, a compl as completed or as a state of being. The diviner thus interpreted an ominous event, while it happened, or when it had just taken place. The apodosis states what the consequence of the portent will be, or expresses a general condition such as chaos, happiness, or the like. The proto protasis describe the event in broad terms or as qualified with further conditions. For example, in an ex, ex spicy text studying the sacrificial animal ha animal's heart, we find both the simple if the apex of the heart is bright to the right and the more complex if the apex of the heart is surrounded with stings and its stings are dried out and the apex of the heart is loose and red. The diviner observed the details needed to draw a conclusion. And each protasis had to contain enough information, enough information to do so. As was true for all Babylonian lists, every case was awarded its separate entry. A few exceptions to this rule always involves numbers, for example, if at top of the increase either two or three concavities are situated. Rather than considering these combinations of two potential ominous occurrences, however, it seems better to regard them within the paradigm as completing a series of options. In essence, the protasis does always describe a very specific omen. Just as the protasis always, almost always describe a single event, the apodosis almost always declares one possible outcome, which can be expressed in ways ranging from very general terms to very specific ones. For example, distress and the enemy, enemy will besiege a city belonging to your, to your auxiliaries, but will not seize, this, seize it. Some omens led to the multiple interpretations. However, the apodosis can state explicitly its second interpretation is, or just list the two outcomes in succession. For example, if there are four palace gates 
an uprising of an usurper king. Its second interpretation, produce will not enter into the palace. Or, if a hole situated in the or of the presence, the fully loaded boat will sink or a pregnant woman will die in labor. The second example shows how the alternatives were not unrelated. The loaded boat was a customary metaphor for pregnant woman. In other cases too, there were connections between the two interpretations. And the diviner schooler seems to have utilized different hermeneutic principle to arrive at a distinct yet related conclusions. One could read the words in the Protasis literally, but also interpret the cuneiform sign used to write them by varying their readings in the same way that the author of the Babylonian creation myth developed the names of the god Marduk. The specificity, the specificity of the predictions can be striking. A lying after have killing, having killed someone in front of the great city gate will be killed or the wife of this man will burn down the house by setting fire to the bed. But they can describe general outcomes as well, such as happiness, being favorable or chaos. The two parts of the Uma were thus relatively simple, with few exceptions. Both Protasis and Apodosis made straightforward statements that were very often exact in nature. The causuistic format of the Omen lists made it possible to restrict individual entries to specific occurrences. But what connected the two parts? Why was a certain protasis the sign of a particular apodosis? For the system to have any credibility to its uses, there had to be a valid connection. And while we cannot now understand its rationality in detail, and probably never will, we should appreciate its coherence. In order to do so, we need to reject the urge to distinguish between the possible and the impossible, the real and the absurd. Modern astronomy tells us, for example, that most omens concerning the plan planet Jupiter in the series Enuma Anu Enlil are impossible as the planet never crosses path with the fixed stars mentioned in the Protasis. This should not lead us to think that the Babylonians who formulated them were ignorant of the fact. They also mentioned the appearance of the sun in the middle of the night. They saw no difference between these, in our opinion, absurd omens and others we consider possible. So we too should approach the omens on the same level. All recorded omens were part of the same Babylonian system of logic. At first indication of the logic behind, every single entry in the omen list is formulation itself. When the genre of omen lists originated in the early second millennium, each statement read, if Shumma in Akkadian. Then, in the first millennium, the condition, conditional if was dropped, and protasis and apodosis were listed side by side, introduced by a vertical check mark indicating a new entry. As in lexical lists and other writings, the statement became x equals y, which you read as x implies y. The omens draw conclusions expressed in the apodosis 
from established premises stated in the Portasis. Thus, like Sherlock Holmes, they used an inferential system of reasoning. The omen lists display a scientific logic that was consistent throughout the myriad of single cases. When we look at omens as expressions of inferential logic, it becomes irrelevant whether or not their content were possible. They function at the level of metaphysical rather than physical possibility. This fact invalidates one of the most common explanations of the relationship between protasis and apodosis. Empirical observation and at the same time removes the apprehension about the absurdity of many omens. For a long time modern scholarship saw at the core of the div divinatory lists a set of omens recording sequences of events that uh, had occurred in reality. The primary basis for this idea was a small group of so-called historical omens, which refer to well-known rulers mostly of the third millennium. For example, if the heart is like the testicle of a sheep, it is an omen of Manishtusho, whom his palace killed, might have recorded an actual ex despicy observation before the murder of the king of the dynasty of Akkad in the 23rd century. Many scholars consider such omens to demonstrate an empirical foundation for divinatory lists, but they are usually so vague as to be meaningless. King Sargon ran into darkness and then saw light, for example, or else they contain clear interpretative elements such as wordplay, so that it is difficult to place much trust in them. None of these events, none of the events these historical omens report are confirmed in non-literally historical resources. There is a large body of scholarship on the value of these omens to the modern historian and opinions range from crediting them with providing the only reliable unedited historical information to rejecting the stories as totally made up. I side with the skeptics but this but the question is of little relevance here as the entire idea of empiricism assumes a mindless collection of observation and a cum hoc ergo propter hoc reasoning. It ignores obvious interpre interpretative schemes in omens, including the historical ones. Those schemes should draw our attention. It's getting mighty interesting, and I bet you, you haven't even seen it yet. But it's coming up now. The connections between protasis and apodosis were rooted in a hermeneutic system that enabled the diviner scholar to see one element and think of another. Mesopotamian scholarship did not usually reveal methods of interpretation explicitly, but there were exceptions, namely in the commentary texts. The final chapter of the large ex-dispicy series was was such a commentary entitled Multabiltu, Interpretation, known only from 1st millennium Assyrian and Babylonian manuscripts. Its first tablet is very unusual in that it tries to explain methodod methodic methodod methodically, methodically how words in the Protasis and the Apodosis relate to one another. It reveals some of the principles used and also how in typical Mesopotamian fashion elaborations led to <coughs> 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 
entries where the connections were indirect and could only be understood by knowing the intermediate steps. The first column of the text lists words from protasis, the second words from the apodosis, and the third provides a sample omen. There is a great deal of artificiality in the entries, including much vocabulary that is not found elsewhere. But three principles are clear. Words are equated because they are homonyms, because they are uh, semantically related, or because, albeit rarely, they are outright synonyms. Sukurti Zakar Shumishuma Resh Manzazi Zukurnish Reshi Rube Umanishum Damikti Ileke. Elevation equals fame. If the top of the presence is elevated, promotion of the prince, my army will win fame, in which Sukurtu elevation and Zakar Shumi fame sound alike. Epictu Ishta Kinatu Shumahashe Imiti Upak Ishta Kina. Massiveness equals stable foundations. If the right side of the lungs is massive, stable foundations. In which epicto, massiveness, and ishtakinato, stable foundations, are semantically related. Magsharu dananu shumai naimiti marti kaku shakinma shaplis itul kaki magshari kaki shamash. Power equals strength. If there is a weapon on the right side of the gallbladder and it points downwards, it is a weapon of power, a weapon of shamash, in which magzaru power and dananu strength are synonyms. As in the lexical list, malku equals sharu indicates. Many parallels remain obscure and the text shows how at least some of them came about through elaboration, just as we saw earlier in the lexical lists. The first four lines of the tablet contain these pairs. Arikto, length, kashito, success, alikto, looseness, kashito, success, ushurto, looseness, kashito, success, Shushur to straightness, Shakap Nakri routing the enemy. The authors clearly played around the homonym because Arikto in the Protasis means success in the Apodosis. Isn't that great? Its homonym Alikto did so as well, and because Ushurto was a synonym of Alikto when the word appeared in Protasis, it too indicated success. The next entry, Ushurtos, feminine Shushurto, foretold the idea of success more intensely as a route. These parallelism came about in indirect ways that are untraceable to us when we see single entries alone. Other commentaries reveal practices that relate closely to the cuneiform writing system and the plurality of readings for individual signs. This explanation of ex despise omen, for example, reads If the well being is like the sign an, an means sky, an means upper and first in rank, it the well-being rises toward the thin part of the gallbladder will reach the highest rank. The an-shaped mark on the liver was thus connected to the sky and upwards, both meanings of the cuneiform sign, 
as well as through semantic association to the first in rank. A commentary on celestial omens is quoted by the, the 7th century Babylonian scholar Zakir in a letter to his Assyrian master, plays around with the homophony of logograms. If the moon's horns at its appearance are very dark, disbandoning of the fortified outpost, retiring of the gods, there will be reconciliation and peace in the land. Gi, to be dark, Gi, to be well, Gi, to be stable, its horns are stable. Indeed, the Sumerian word gi to be stable and gi six to be dark are homonous, while gi four as part of the compound su, gi, had an Akkadian equivalent that derived from the word to be well. The scholar used the same rules as the interpreters of Marduk's names mentioned in chapter 1. Unfortunately, commentaries are often opaque to us, and it's clear that we will never be able to establish a full lexicon of divinatory terms. Figurative language is always culturally dependent, and we are not familiar enough with the Babylonians' culture to recognize many things they would take for granted. It is possible to recognize some of the principles at the basis of all human interpretations, however. Homonymy, a system of punning based on similarities of sound, was the most obvious principle. Its use were, was aided by the symmetric structure of Akkadian vocabulary, in which root consonants were be, uh, the building blocks of multiple words. A much quoted example is one of the so-called historical omens, which survived for the entire history of Babylonian divinatory writing. In old Babylonian times it read, if in the liver the part called the palace gate is double, if there are three kidneys and if the right hand side of the gold ladder, two clearly marked perforations, bilshu, are pierced, palshu, this is the omen of, in, of the inhabitants of Apishal, whom Naram Sin made prisoner prisoner by a bridge pilshu in the wall. A pishal who Naram seen made prisoner by a bridge pilshu in the wall. The wordplay around the free consonant plish, rendering not only ideas of breaching, but through a metathesis, also the city name Apishal. In the first millennium, the apodosis of this omen became more elaborate. Omen of Naram Shin, who by this omen marched against the city of Apishal, made a breach and captured Rishadad the king of the city of Apishal and the vizier of the city of Apishal. But as we saw, Babylonian scholars were always eager to tinker with text and they played around with this passage in multiple ways. Two strands developed, one maintaining the word play and the other removing direct traces of it. Instead of the word breach in the protasis, the second strand employed synonyms such as split and whole, which do not contain the root consonant pilch in Akkadian. If the liver has two fingers and a weapon is placed on the right side and points to the left, there are seven splits written with the logo logogram do eight, pitru in Akkadian, in front of it. There is a hole written with the logogram Burr 3, Shilo in Akkadian, on the left side of the gold ladder, end of quote. 
their connections between protasis and apodosis in this first millennium version of the omen are incomprehensible without the knowledge of earlier texts. Clearly, the ancient scholars copying this omen played around with it, elaborating certain parts and substituting words in others. Only rarely can we uncover such moves. Not always the same symmetric groups were involved in homonymy, and associations could rely on other sound similarities. Two ominous signs led to the outcome of an observer, of a surfer. For example, if the gold letters are five, Akkadian Hamish, and a serpent king, Akkadian Hamma, will appear on the scene. In an old Babylonian omen, while if the coils of the intestine look like the face of Huawa, written logographically, Hum Hum, it is the omen of the serpent king, Hamma, written logographically, Im Gi, who ruled all lands in the late Babylonian lists. The diviner was a reader and resemblance with cuneiform graphems were very important in both ecstasy and physio physiognomic omens. In the first discipline a small number of relatively simple signs were involved. Some explanations seem straightforward. A sign with cross wedges in indicated discord, a strike that we both had sexual intercourse. Other explanations required knowledge of multiple readings of cuneiform signs. For example, if the well being is like the tar sign. A dish at the king's meal will break and the lamplighter will tremble, or the cup will shake in the cupbearer's hand. And a quote. We can understand this when we know that an alternative reading of tar is hash, to break, while the Sumerian tar sign can also stand for the Akkadian verb tararu, to tremble. There is a 57 line long section in the Physiognomic Omen series, Alandimu, that in identifies marks on the patient's forehead that looks like cuneiform signs, some more complex than those in ecstasy. Except when the cuneiform signs are very simple, such as if there is a Ninda sign, i.e., bread the man will hunger for bread. The interpretations elude us, however. Semantic association seems to have been the main interpretation, interpretive tool. It has long been recognized that the sign on the right was a positive one, while the same sign on the left was a negative, although all depended on the context in which it appeared. If it was written on a malformed birth, the reverse was true, as the misshapen creature itself was a negative sign. What was positive to the Babylonian or Assyrian was negative to the enemy. If a sign appeared more than once, an even number of occurrences were positive, and while an odd number was negative. These simple rules were developed into the greatest details in the paradigm, paradigms on the list. And in the next section we'll explore them in that context. There, were, there was also a system of more intricate parallelisms. When looking at a body, they had referred to the king. When look, uh, the, the neck the neck to the royal power, the eyes related to water, because the Akkadian words for eye and spring were the same, Inu. The mouth had connection to eating and speaking, including lying and inciting rebellion. Something resembling a lion brought to mind royal power. 
a contracted element indicated loss of control. Blood on the wall of a house predicted the death of a son. And so on. A mixture of connections could tie the protasis to the apodosis, as in the gem of human psychology. If in the palace of the finger two designs are drawn together, and between them lies request mark, the wife of a man has become pregnant by another man, and she will constantly pray to the goddess Ishtar while looking at her husband's face. I will w make what is in, in, inside my belly look like him. Well, I think this goes to show that we are obsessed with something uh, like logocentrism in modern time. We took away handwriting in the absurd idea that handwriting doesn't mean anything. It changes the differences. The graphic form doesn't have any meaning but instead that meaning resides somewhere else, maybe in the speaking word, or even more transcendental than that. The Sumerians, although how different they are from us and the Babylonians, did not think that. And I would say no other culture on earth has thought that, but that is most definitely the gesture or the logocentrism of modern culture. And to add something else, I'm just going to hint here, because this is way too interesting to reveal directly. And what will this do, for instance, when it comes to uh, interpreting biblical texts in modern thought or shape? Think about that. It has huge implications on that, how that should be done. Uh, I think I am there. Uh, it was quite enough day and I say thank you very much and wish you a very pleasant afternoon. Bye bye for now.